responsible technology and responsible automation is the topic of my talk. And I thought before I start, I would start with some confessions. So uh, I, uh, I was a practicing engineer for a number of years, um, and I worked in the field of, of designing automation tools for different applications. And this is, is one example of some of the work that I did. This was while I was a co-op student still uh, in engineering. And I worked for the Canadian Coast Guard. And what we were doing is we were building a rack of equipment that replaced a lighthouse keeper. So that little rack that's suspended from that helicopter in the slide here uh, essentially effectively replaced a lighthouse keeper. And of course, my thinking, being trained as an engineer at the time, and, and I must confess, I didn't really think a whole lot about the implications of some of the things I was building back in those days. Um, essentially, it made sense. It's more efficient. So why wouldn't you do it, right? Of course, it's more efficient, it's less costly, and, uh, and so it's a no-brainer. Um, later on, here's some more goofy pictures of me uh, in, in, in some of the jobs that I've worked on. So uh, what we have in the top left corner there is an automated guided vehicle uh, for delivering large rolls of, of paper in a factory. Uh, and then here's a human scale robot, and I worked for a company that actually um, uh, designed these servo control systems that went inside of that robot arm, and that's a Canadian company that manufactured this. This is uh, another company out of Burlington. Uh, it's an XYZ routing table, and it automates a lot of manufacturing as well. And this is a pick and place machine that automatically puts together um, components, uh, electronic components on circuit boards. So these are all automation sort of applications that we were working on that were displacing people in some cases in the field. And I must confess that as a wet behind the ears, green young engineer, I was never really taught to think about some of the other factors beyond efficiency and how many parts you can manipulate per hour and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it wasn't until later on that I started to realize that uh, things are a little bit more multi-aspectual than just the technical kind of considerations. Um, it's easy to develop a kind of um, tunnel vision when you're trained as an engineer. Um, and, uh, and these are some of the things that I want to talk about today. Of course, concerns about uh, automation are not new. Um, there's the famous example of the Luddites. Um, maybe some of you have been accused of being a Luddite. It's a term that's, that's used to this day. Um, but the Luddites, <clears throat> were a group of folks in the early 1800s, in the beginning of the 19th century, who were very upset about the automation in the textile industry of these automatic looms that were actually used punch cards to be able to, to, to sort of weave patterns and automate certain tasks in the textile industry. And they were uh, threatened by this and upset by this. And for a couple of years, they went around, you know, smashing these machines and burning down factories and so on and, and until they were kind of uh, um, opposed by the, by the local authorities. Uh, but they were, the, the, the term that was coined for them was the Luddites, um, apparently because they were the followers of a fictitious leader named Ned Ludd. Uh, but Luddite was sort of the, uh, the term that sort of stuck. And so today, sometimes people are referred to as neo-Luddites if they're against technology. But this, this sort of uh, opposition to automation is not, is not new. And of course, today, um, as we speak, robots are being employed in all kinds of different places, including our homes. How many of you have a Roomba? Anyone here have a Roomba? Yeah. So you just unleash it in your house, and it basically vacuums up uh, all the debris on your carpet and on your floor. In agriculture, um, automated milking machines are becoming more common. This is an automatic uh, lawn cutter. Um, in space, of course, the Canada arm is an example of robotics in outer space and in the manufacturing line. And there's actually a professor here associated with McMaster that was doing work with robotics and surgery. And so we've, we've seen automation find its way to all kinds of different areas. And, uh, and the question has been, how is this going to impact jobs? And I have a quote here from, uh, from some, do we have any economists here? Okay, well, this is a, a group of economists, and, and a lot of the work that I'm citing actually today comes from publications from different economists. But this is in 1987, so uh, sort of towards the end of the 20th century, uh, there was a, a gathering of economists who put together a publication um, about automation and the effects of automation and innovation. 
And this is, this is sort of what they came up with. They said, for the foreseeable future, reductions in labor requirements per unit output resulting from new process technologies have been and will continue to be outweighed by the beneficial employment effects of the expansion in total output that generally occurs. Okay, that, that's a bit of a mouthful, but basically that's saying, you know, sure, we can automate things and then production goes up and then basically from that increase in output, we get more jobs and more opportunities and so these things tend to balance each other out. And we've seen that, right? The uh, the, the people who made, uh, you know, horse and buggy uh, equipment in the old days, right, when the horse and buggy uh, went the way of the horse and buggy, um, we see automobile uh, uh, manufacturing taking over, jobs being created and stimulated in that uh, part of the economy. When you look at automated teller machines, you still have people working in banks and providing different kinds of services. Uh, and the examples go on and on and on. That as, as we automate, or as we've seen the use of automation and technology in the workplace, generally speaking, with exceptions throughout, uh, throughout the years due to different economic circumstances, we see that jobs tend to track productivity. And, and uh, in, in artificial intelligence circles, there's this... this uh, a um, well-known paradox that has been uh, cited, and that paradox basically uh, states uh, the following. It's called Moravec's paradox. It says that where computers are good is where humans are weak, and where humans are uh, good is where computers are weak. So th think about some simple examples, you know, doing tons of multiplications or inverting matrices, you know, something that we can do manually by hand, but it's very, very tedious, and of course we're prone to mistakes and and uh, and so on. But machines will happily just crunch through number uh, number <coughs> computations um, ad nauseum without any uh, without any difficulty. And on the flip side, humans, you know, are 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 often identified as being effective at innovative thinking and creative thinking and relationships and these sorts of things. And machines, of course, are ill suited for those tasks. So. The, uh, the, the author of this book, The New Division of Labor, kind of suggested, well, we've got these natural divisions. We've got this Moravec paradox. And so basically what we need to do is build a world where, uh, where these two complement each other. So what we find is that you know, um, there'll be certain tasks that'll be automated, other tasks that'll always be uh, the domain of, of, of humans. And this is the quote uh, that they gave at that time. This is a quote from that book. A uh, physical task that cannot be well described as following a set of if-then-do rules have proven, have proven extremely difficult for computers to carry out. Examples include driving a truck. Computerization should have little effect on the percentage of, of the workforce engaged in these tasks. So this is 2004, okay? So actually in 2004, or just a little bit before, the early 2000s, I was working here at McMaster on this campus in the communications research lab for the computer vision group in the electrical engineering department. And I suspect that if you asked any of us, myself and any of my colleagues and my, my professor uh, at the time, um, will you ever be able to build a computer vision system that will be able to navigate cars in the real world? We would have laughed at you. So people who were at the head of sort of the, the front edge of, of research at that time were quite skeptical about the ability of being able to unleash a robot or a car for that matter into the real world in unstructured environments with variations in lighting and all kinds of you know unforeseen sort of obstacles and situations that can arise. And they had this DARPA challenge. I don't know if you remember this. They sort of unleashed these cars into the desert. And it was always kind of funny to see them. They would encounter some bizarre obstacle and get confused and get stuck or tip over or I mean it was it was, it was a little bit of a, of a funny thing to watch and of course we all thought yeah this is a big problem well uh, Google has cracked the nut so to speak like they've, they've built this autonomous car and they've unleashed it and it's driven hundreds of thousands of kilometers um, I think it got into one accident it was rear-ended by someone else once and there were some other minor sort of problems but generally speaking Right, they, they, they've done this. And, uh, and driving in <clears throat> sort of an unstructured real world environment is not something you do with an if then do kind of coding uh, paradigm. Uh, advances in artificial intelligence and sensor fusion and deep learning and so on have created some very powerful tools. And machines are beginning to do things that we 
many of us thought were not possible at, at one time. Of course, we're seeing machines being employed in, in, uh, in a lot of areas like factory automation. So if you actually just look at the, uh, at, at the news uh, headlines, uh, just in recent uh, sort of months, in the recent year or so, there's all kinds of headlines about automation beginning to en masse even more take over jobs in places like China, uh, in, in developing countries where a lot of uh, manual uh, manufacturing tasks are performed, and we're seeing uh, lots and lots of people being displaced uh, by automation work. Um, of course, you've all probably heard of the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the work being done on the Amazon drone for deliveries. Uh, I think it was uh, UPS is looking at building drones that sort of sit on top of their trucks, and then they drive and park, and the drones go and make deliveries. And of course, um, um, you know, all of these things are going to displace jobs. Um, and, uh, and, and think about, for instance, in the United States, I don't know, do any of you know what the most common job for a man is in the United States? Anyone? Truck driver. Yeah, truck driver. So the most common job for a man in the United States is a truck driver. Think about it. If you can build, uh, you know, if Google can provide an autonomous vehicle package that you can bolt on to a truck for $10,000 or whatever it is, it'll become a no-brainer economically to replace truck drivers with autonomous trucks. That you unleash them, they go down to Florida and pick up a bunch of fruit and they bring it back. They don't have to stop uh, except for refueling. Um, and, and you think about it, three million uh, people displaced um, from their jobs uh, due to uh, automation that is rapidly coming. Um, taxi drivers, Uber is working on, uh, and Wago, uh, I think uh, Google has their own project. Uh, for replacing taxi drivers and delivery vehicles and, and drones and so on. So there are huge changes that are on our front doorstep right now, just in those sorts of areas. Uh, and what are those three million truck drivers going to do? Um, how do we how do we reemploy or how do we treat fairly people who are affected by these kinds of changes? And a bunch of reports have also come out recently in the United States. This is a report from the. Uh, Office of the President of the United States, December 2016, so that this is still uh, when Obama was in the White House, and it's basically a, a report on artificial intelligence automation and the economy. And here's one of the um, charts from that particular report, and you can find it at the uh, address there. Uh, basically, there's, there, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, so they have a, a range of replacement weights between 60 and 100 percent. Uh, so th there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of how much of an impact this is going to have. But if you look at the, the numbers of bus drivers, of light truck delivery drivers, heavy tractor trailer drivers, and so on, there's the number of jobs in the United States, the, the predicted sort of replacement factors, and the amount of jobs that will be impacted. And, and, and we're looking in the range of two to three million jobs for that particular industry alone. In Canada, there's been a recent report from the Mowat Center at the University of Toronto, which has done a an analysis on uh, automation and its impact on all kinds of different jobs. And they've used two different methodologies that come up with different numbers. So again, there's, there's uncertainty. People don't know for certain how many of these jobs are going to disappear. But even if the low end of the range is correct, we're looking at a huge chunk of, uh, of jobs that are going to be affected by these sorts of changes. And how many of you saw Watson on Jeopardy? How many of you watched Jeopardy when IBM Watson was playing against the world reigning Jeopardy champion. That was a number of years ago already, but the IBM Watson computer project has continued uh, its development and it's, it's made some remarkable uh, innovations and it's been targeted for uh, areas like uh, law and medicine and other areas um, to automate white collar jobs. So we're not just looking at blue collar jobs and truck drivers, we're also looking at jobs that are beginning to be displaced in finance, in, uh, in medicine, uh, assisting with medical diagnosis and, and, and reading medical charts and, and medical uh, uh, images. Um, in, in law, uh, one of these, um, um, the, the IBM Watson and, and systems like it are able to sift through decades of case law that would take you know, a, a bunch of lawyers or interns uh, weeks to, to sort through in a library to be able to bring to bear appropriate legal cases and so on. So they're looking at automating uh, a lot of tasks that we haven't traditionally associated with, with ro robotics and so on. 
This is a this is a CBC headline from February 28th, so just just last month. Uh, as well or better automation set for big promotions and white collar job market, and it, it's a summary of some of these changes that are afoot. So yeah, it, 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 it's it's broad. Its its reach is going to be far, and the possibilities of some of the machines that we're seeing are going far beyond uh, what uh, I think many people had thought possible. And this more of X paradox is not as clear as it used to be. Machines are able to do more and more of the things that we thought only people could do. And when economists are beginning to see the effects of this as well. And this is just an example of one plot that's a little startling. It it uh, uh, let me show you here um, from the New York Times. So traditionally, over the past decades, from the last uh, century on, uh, productivity and jobs have kind of tracked each other. So as, as productivity increased, uh, what we saw is that jobs increased. You know, as more stuff was being made, more people were being employed, and these, these two, you know, with, with exceptions uh, due to different economic circumstances, these, 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 these lines tended to track each other. And what we saw is in the last uh, period, uh, during that great sort of uh, recession uh, a number of years ago, we saw that that graph became sort of decoupled. What we saw is productivity continued to climb while uh, private employment and jobs uh, tended to stagnate. And, uh, and, and that was a, of concern. And a lot of people um, who've been looking at some of these trends are attributing this to automation uh, and to uh, um, the role of automation in the workplace. And a whole bunch of books and articles and so on have been uh, appearing in recent time. Yes? Just a question for clarification on that last slide. That productivity, is that per person or total for the country? I would have to go back and look at what the y-axis is there, but you're looking at, uh, basically looking at the relationship of productivity to jobs, yeah. and, uh, and there, there's a decoupling that's happening. Um, uh, so I, I, I think this is the concern that a lot of economists are, 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 uh, are, are, are sounding. Um, and here's just some of the books. Some of these are, 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 are not as recent as others, but one a recent book that has done a very good job, I think, of looking at this situation is The Second Machine Age. Um, but uh, this one's a, a little bit older, The Race Against the Machine. And then, you know, a lot of recent books about artificial intelligence and the kinds of uh, uh, disruption that's going to come with that, the end of work. And The Atlantic magazine, uh, I think it was last year, had a whole article about the end of work. And, uh, and, and, and the effects of automation on that. Um, there was a Wired Up uh, article decades ago already by Bill Joy, who was the former chief technology officer of Sun Microsystems, who wrote an article that has been widely cited and read called The Future Doesn't Need Us, and uh, talking about robotics and automation, among other developments. A, a bit of a depressing kind of view of the future. Um, but yeah, we need to think about this. Um, Here's some quotes from, from some of those sources. Two economic consequences of machine progress, increased bounty and spread. So this is the second machine age. They identify that two of the effects of this, th this rapid rise in automation is increased bounty. And what they mean by that is that there will be lots of high quality, cheap products that will be able to be manufactured. So it'll become an easier to build lots and lots of stuff. It'll become cheaper and it'll become more abundant. So there will be a bounty that will come with, with, with automation. And on the flip side, they're saying there will also be a spread. So the benefits of this, uh, of this bounty will be very concentrated in terms of certain individuals who own manufacturing plants and have um, influence in certain areas and a lot of other folks whose jobs get displaced by automation and robotics and so on will be left out. And so there'll be a lot of stuff and a lot of capability for producing um, many, many goods, uh, but there will be a concentration of the benefits to a very small select uh, group of people. And, and, um, and so they're predicting um, some, some issues that will arise uh, out of that. And a few other uh, quotes here. I won't, uh, I won't spend too much time, but um, basically... This is from the end of work, which was, which was written almost two decades ago or two decades ago now. We're entering a new phase in world history, one in which fewer and fewer workers will be needed to produce the goods and services for the global population. 
Um, and then if you go even further, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who I think we've talked about at CSEA before, uh, his book, uh, The Singularity is Near, is predict predicting even more profound uh, disruptions in terms of, you know, what it means to be human, human right? Um, and uh, what happens when computers are smarter than than people, and, and, and he makes some bold predictions about the ability to even download our brains into computers and so on, which which I think uh, is based on faulty presuppositions about what it means to be human. But, you know, again, looking at some of these um, possibilities. I thought I would just show you this painting. This is a painting that hangs in the art gallery of Hamilton. Uh, it's called uh, Horse and Train by Alex Colville, and it hangs here in the art gallery of Hamilton. It's actually much darker when you see it in the gallery. If you're, you're ever at the art gallery of Hamilton, it might be a painting to keep your eye out for, but what do you see when you look at this painting? I show this to my students sometimes. What, what does this painting make you think of? A big headache. A big headache? <laughs> no. Okay. Technology versus, versus life. life. What's that? Technology versus life. Okay. Uh, elaborate. Well, uh, technology about, is about to mow down life. It would appear unless the horses could put it in step sideways. Yeah. A few seconds from now, this is not going to be a pretty picture. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with technology comes certain possibilities. Uh, that that, but what we see here is a collision between these two things, or an impending collision, possibly. Right? Um, uh, this, this beautiful animal is galloping forward. Uh, it seems oblivious to this train that's that's hurtling down the tracks, and uh, um, unless something happens unexpected, it's clear who is going to prevail um, in, in in a few moments, and uh, and it seems. Inevitable, yeah. It's also the element of um, the energy, the, the, the wonderfully efficient uh, evolution of the biological machine against the clumsy evolution of, of our machines and the amount of energy used and everything. Yes. That, that's clashing too. Yeah, yes. It could get off the tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did, did this painting gets a lot of responses from my students too. I'll take one or two more comments and then, then we'll move uh, on. Yeah. The light on the train as a seduction. Okay. That's where you focus See? in to draw you in, that it's the new bright age. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's clever. I see a tragedy because the beauty. It's a beautiful I guess if you animal. Love trains, you love trains. You love trains. <laughs> if the beauty is in the light yeah. and that it's free. It's a beautiful animal, isn't it? Yeah. It's yes. also, I think. Uh, Bruce Colbert, it's one of his elder hours. Okay. So, I mean, what, what, yes, go, one, one, one more comment. There's a sign there, and it's telling the train to stop, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows what's on that sign? It's the name of a town. It's the name of a town, okay. So, when I show this to my students, it, it, it elicits the same kind of response, you know, all kinds of, you know, things that people see when they look at this painting. It evokes an emotional response. And I think one of the things that, that, uh, that, this, that, that I use this to introduce is the whole notion of determinism. You know, there's this notion of technological determinism, that technology is this autonomous force beyond our control. And, and some people would suggest that perhaps automation is the same thing. I mean, it's inevitable. There's nothing we can do, right? That train is hurtling down the tracks, and we can, if we stand on the tracks, we're just going to get mowed down, or we can get on the train, right? And who knows where the train's going, but you know, it's better than being in front of it. So I, 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 the, the notion of technological determinism is the, the philosophy that there is no choice. And, and what it's driven by, Jacques Alol would say, and, and Neil Postman, I have some quotes here, and, and, and the... These are from writings from decades ago already, but that the driving sort of uh, impetus behind this is efficiency, right? It, 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 it's, it's the drive for efficiency in all areas of human life. And I would say that that's one of the animating spirits in the world of an, uh, automation as well. Yeah, I saw a hand here. Well, it makes me think of the Amish. Ah. There's a group there that's determined not to yes. meet the train. Yes, so, so the, the, the question is, Christians then, is, is how do we engage uh, the, this area of culture? And, and uh, what it makes me think of as well is, uh, is this, this movie, WALL-E. Have you guys seen WALL-E? Yeah. If you haven't, you should go and watch it. It's a beautiful movie, a beautiful parable 
Um, but yeah, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, in, in, in quick summary, you know, the humans are relegated to this state of floating around in lazy boy chairs and slurping slurpees and, and, and watching video screens and, and, and being a shadow of what it means to be a, a human being fully alive. And in fact, um, uh, the most human characters in the movie WALL-E are the robots. <laughs> They're actually the most most human characters in the movie, and and it's kind of sad. I, I see it as a dystopian kind of picture about what it means to be human, and 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 the humans are quite comfortable and happy to be stuck in this state, right? They're 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 obese and they're unable to do what they're that they're normally called to do, and they live in in, in these lives where an automated machine looks after all their needs uh, and entertains them. And of course, I would I would say that um, the whole notion of of work and stuff is one in which the Christian tradition has um, has a lot to say. Right, going back to Genesis, um, uh, what does it mean uh, to be made in the image of God? What does it mean to um, uh, to be given the ability to work? What what is the role of work in our life? Um, one book which I think paints a beautiful picture of, of vocation and work and so on is Stephen Garber's book. Uh, visions of vocation, if you haven't read that. But there's lots. There's lots more. There's uh, Timothy Keller. Um, Every Good Endeavor is a, is a wonderful book about work. Uh, Andy Crouch, uh, Culture Making, talks about uh, how we've been called by God to be culture makers, to unfold the possibilities in creation. Culture is what we make of the world, and that's what we're called to do. Lee Hardy from Calvin College uh, wrote a book called The Fabric of This World, which is a, a, a book that talks about all kinds of different aspects of work from a Christian perspective. Um, he says there that work is the social place where people can exercise the gifts that God has given them in the service of others. So work was something um, that was presented to us before the fall. It's not a result of sin. It's not something that we need to try and uh, eliminate from our lives, but it's part of who we are. Um, and in fact, some of the discussions about automation are what happens if... If we have a world where people no longer work, um, you know, and people talk about, well, maybe we need to have a, a basic uh, um, guaranteed income for everybody. You know, we need to find ways to deal with this. But the problem is, is that we need more than just an income. We uh, work is, is much more fundamental to who we are and, and, and what we're called to be. And I think um, it's part of our creational calling and our identity as image bearers. And there's something uh, that we need to recognize there. Um, so, um, so as we face a world of automation, uh, how do we proceed? Recognizing the goodness of work, uh, but also the um, the world of automation. What what is it that we're um, that we should be thinking about? Well, I I, uh, I I've I've appreciated a lot of Neil Postman's uh, writings and. Uh, and in one of his talks, he, he came up with what's called six helpful questions about technology. Uh, he actually raised these at a, at a talk he did at Calvin College, um, uh, uh, yeah, almost two decades ago, uh, in the late 90s, I think it was. And I found those questions very, very helpful. And what I thought is, well, why don't I adapt those questions from Neil Postman towards automation? So he, he, he originally posed them about technology. But uh, I think we can, we can actually look at those questions and, uh, and, and sort of direct them towards uh, automation as well. So very, very quickly, here's, here's just a few questions. What's the problem for which automation is a solution? Like, why do we need automation? What is the problem? And that's a good question to ask, as it turns out. Uh, whose problem is it solving? Is it the owner? Is it the worker? Is, it, is there you know, some other, other reason for this automation? What problems will automation create, even as it solves another? I mean, that, that's a good thing to think of beforehand. Um, what people or institutions are hurt by automation? Of course, we've already mentioned the obvious, right? workers, truck drivers, and others, perhaps. What changes in language are being forced by automation? And language, of course, changes thinking. And so uh, sometimes when you see technology come, there's also an accompanying change in language. What sort of people and institutions gain special economic and political power through automation? Uh, one book I read talked about what happens to unions when you start to automate, what happens to the power of workers, and, 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 and so on. So there's a power change as well. And what these questions, um, uh, I think, are helpful for is to recognize that technology is not neutral. 
it's, it's value laden, that there are social implications, there are economic implications, there's power, there's justice implications. There's all kinds of other things that come out of uh, automation that we need to be thinking about. And so I think uh, as Christians, uh, we need to be thinking about, uh, about these sorts of things in the world of technology and specifically in, in, in automation as well. And I think what we need to do is recognize that automation, the question, is automation good or bad? is a false dichotomy. Automation is part of the possibilities in creation. And so to, to ask whether it's good or bad, I think is sort of the wrong question to pose. I think the question to ask is, uh, to what is it directed? How are we using it? Uh, if, if automation is part of the good possibilities that God placed in creation, like technology, music, and other, other aspects of culture, uh, how do we use it in a way that honors God? builds the kind of society and, and, and builds uh, the kind of world that is like the one that God intended for his people, makes us more like the people God intended us to be, uh, including our work and our relationship to it. And uh, and I like this quote from Frederick Brooks. Frederick Brooks, perhaps some of you have heard of him before. He's, 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 he's a top flight computer scientist, a uh, well-respected uh, fellow who, who wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month, um, did some pioneering work in, in computing. Um, and he, he says this, it's time to recognize that the original goals of AI were not merely extremely difficult. They were goals that, although glamorous and motivating, sent the discipline off in the wrong direction. And I, I like that idea of direction. And uh, um, I think that, uh, I think with automation, we have to think about direction. It's part of the possibilities in creation, but to what is it directed? How are we using it? Uh, how can we use automation to help people and the greater creation to flourish? That's the kind of question we should ask. Now, that doesn't give us simple answers when we face difficult problems, but it gives us a framework to begin working with. I would also suggest that there are some norms that we can, that we can look at. So norms are sort of areas where we exercise freedom and responsibility. Uh, norms are sort of the way things ought to be. And so uh, what I'll do is I'll quickly go through a list of norms that I've, I've used before in, in other applications of technology, but norms that I think are helpful to provide some, some framework, some additional framework for thinking about automation. Um, one norm is cultural appropriateness. And I think, uh, I think this is a helpful one to remember in a lot of different situations. So basically the question here is, does automation alleviate burdens and preserve what's good in a culture? And one example is, and, and this is a very quick example, grinding corn in Tanzania. Uh, a while back, there was a bunch of consultants who proposed introducing electric grinders uh, to automate the task of, of grinding grain in Tanzania because they saw this backbreaking work that people were doing, and they thought, oh, we can automate that. We can come back with machines and we'll power them up, and they'll just they'll, they'll grind through all this grain in no time flat. But what they recognized after they experimented with this is that it destroyed social groupings and interactions that were essential to the culture. The actual harvest and the, and, and the uh, processing of the grain was actually part of the culture in this setting, which they had failed to recognize. And so what they did is, out of respect for the culture, they went back and they designed hand grinders, uh, which alleviated some of the burdens that were traditionally associated with grinding this, the, the, this, this grain, and the strain that was associated with it, but it maintained the social groupings and the social patterns that were there. So thinking about the cultural appropriateness of automation is something that we need to, we need to think about. Transparency is another norm. Transparency has to do with providing clear and honest information, not bearing false witness. So being upfront and honest about how we're automating and, and what sort of data is being used in AI when decisions are being made and automated. Labels that indicate that, um, uh, that, you know, not labeling things as hand-built when they're not or handcrafted, uh, being open and honest about the risks that might come with automation and clearly commuting, communicating that to customers and to workers. Stewardship uh, is a norm. Um, oh, social norms, uh, I would add quickly, social norms have to do with how we relate to each other. And I'll talk briefly in a little bit about some attempts in some areas to actually automate <laughs> care. <laughs> uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but stewardship has, the norms of stewardship have to, have to deal with economic stewardship, environmental stewardship, but also human resources. Um, delightful harmony has to do with the intersection of function and aesthetics. 
So when we, uh, when, when we design automation systems, they should be made to assist human workers. People should not be forced to adapt to machines. Um, they should be pleasing and satisfying to use. If you think about dashboards and interfaces and so on, uh, need to be thought of clearly. Uh, justice has to do uh, with giving everything its rightful due. When you think of robots and personhood, you know, how do we deal with that? Intellectual property falls under this, this sort of norm. Um, when an autonomous robot uh, does something uh, that causes harm, who is responsible? Uh, there's going to be some... And, and in fact, autonomous cars have this ethical issue too. What happens if an, ethical, if an autonomous car hits someone? Who is responsible for that? Um, caring, showing love for our neighbors. Uh, there's a whole field called roboethics um, that, that, that has arisen recently. Uh, trust. The trust norm has to, be, has to deal with... Uh, dependability, and that dependability extends, especially in areas where we automate things on which people's lives and, and well-being depend, the electrical grid and uh, 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 machinery used in healthcare and so on. But trust also has to deal with sort of where we put our ultimate trust. You know, are we putting our trust in technology and automation, or are we recognizing that our ultimate trust is, needs to be in, in God alone? And so all of these sort of things are, are different norms that often, to be frank, uh, we're not trained to think about in engineering school. Uh, we're, we think a lot more about efficiency than we do about a lot of uh, other things. Um, and so I, I think these are helpful ways of expanding the thinking about uh, what you're doing as an engineer. Uh, that a technical uh, sort of project is not just bits and bytes and nuts and bolts and, and, and so on and gears and pulleys, but it's uh, uh, it has yeah it has justice implications, has social implications, has environmental implications, all of these sorts of things we need to be thinking about more robustly. And of course, within all of this, there needs to be a posture of humility, because we don't always know, uh, even if we think about these things, some of the implications that will be coming down as a result of some of these products and services that we're developing. So, okay, so the, the, those norms are, are, are helpful. Again, they don't, they don't give trivial answers, but they're, they're, they provide a bit of a framework. Um, and so I was thinking maybe, maybe, maybe what we can do uh, to, to, to carve out the space a little bit more is to consider three different things uh, when it comes to automation, three possible categories for automation. So one category, areas where automation is appropriate. Can we think of using those norms some of those uh, concepts that I talked about earlier. Can we think about areas where actually uh, uh, automation might be completely appropriate? Uh, in fact, maybe it's something we ought to do. Are there areas where perhaps it's more appropriate to combine humans with automation, with robots and so on, where some combination of humans plus machines is a better solution? And then can we identify applications for which automation is completely inappropriate? Um, and areas where for normative reasons, um, for reasons for loving our neighbor and so on, uh, we ought to just decide up front that these are places we don't want to go, even though perhaps we could. Um, so why don't we take a look at the first category. So what are, what are areas that are appropriate for automation? And I know in the robotics world, people often talk about the three Ds, dull, dangerous, and dirty. So these are applications where uh, robots and automation can actually really help us. Um, you know, dull, repetitive tasks... Uh, sorting recyclable goods, extended search and rescue operations, uh, dirty, waste cleanup, uh, hazardous waste cleanup, um, uh, firefighting, underground mining, right, where, where it's actually not a, a, a great location for humans to be working. Uh, dangerous applications, humanitarian demining, you know, removing uh, landmines from, from old battlefields. Um, Battlefield extraction assistance, you know, going into dangerous situations and helping people. Space exploration, uh, sending machines rather than people in certain applications. Undersea exploration and so on, you know, areas that, that are dangerous. And, of course, in medicine, too, looking for ways to use automation and robotics in medicine to provide assistance to people. And, and I would say if you look at some of these things, um, these are areas where perhaps we ought to do some automation. These are areas where uh, we can actually make uh, make a difference, where we can show love to our neighbor, and and so on. I think automating tasks that also care for the earth, monitoring the environment and the oceans and the atmosphere, uh, are, are areas too where we can we can employ automation to help us as we try to care for the earth. 
I thought I would give you a real quick example of one project that I did here at McMaster University. So for a time, um, I was uh, collaborating with some folks in the electrical and computer engineering department. And, uh, and one of the grad students we worked with there did a project on automating the visual sorting of some recyclable goods. So we visited the material um, uh, recycling facility in Hamilton. And, uh, and it's a fascinating place, actually. And there's a lot of it that's already automated, you know, uh, when it comes to recycling metals and so on. They've used magnetics and, and sorting certain types of plastics. They've got, um, they've got certain types of sensors that are able to detect the, the, the plastic type and so on, uh, hyperspectral imaging techniques and so on. But there was one area where there was actually still hand sorting going on when it came to polycoat containers uh, that were being put in, in the blue box. And, and they actually had a person who was actually by hand sorting some of the stuff on a big belt that was moving at whatever it was, a meter per second or whatever. And it would seem like tedious, dirty, dull, <laughs> maybe not dangerous, but it was dirty and dull. And I thought, that's something we ought to automate. And so uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't come up with, uh, with something that would be... Uh, um, readily uh, marketable, but we came up with uh, some ideas that could uh, automate this to a certain degree, and, and we did a bit of an experiment combining some field programmable gate arrays and some computer vision uh, work to, to do that. And I thought, well, that's a good example, I think, of appropriate automation. In fact, I'll bet you if you went over here and looked inside of these blue boxes in this garbage can, you'll find that there's probably plastic bottles in the garbage. Yeah, There's a lot of stuff where people don't really think and they don't put it in the right place. And a lot of material ends up in a landfill that could be properly uh, recycled. So think, people talk, uh, are talking about the possibility one day of having single stream sort of waste, where you put everything in one box, so you don't have you know, all the different blue boxes and so on. And then there's a machine, an automated process, um, that separates all of the materials that can be repurposed and recycled. Uh, isn't that a beautiful example of how automation can help us reuse our materials better and do a better job of redirecting things from landfills and so on? I, I think those are good examples of appropriate automation. I think there's also examples of uh, places where humans plus automation is an appropriate um, solution. So this is where that norm that I talked about, the aesthetic norm, the delightful harmony norm, where people working with machines uh, to make tasks more pleasing and satisfying. Uh, Frederick Brooks, uh, again, um, uh, the fellow I quoted earlier, has, uh, has suggested that IA is always greater than AI. And what he means by that is uh, intelligence augmentation is always better than artificial intelligence. So, so people combined with machines can always do better than just machines. Right, and so there are some tasks where where people and machines working together can do can do a lot better. So cobots, which uh, here's an example of a of a, of a recent uh, robot development product called Baxter, which is able to work alongside people, and and people can actually grab its arm and actually show it a task, and it'll learn how to do certain things. Uh, robots are very good at precision and heavy lifting, and so when there's tasks that involve heavy lifting or precise sort of tasks that require a lot of repeatability and, and accuracy to have a robot working alongside a person. Uh, I think automation has tremendous possibilities for new creative uh, work. So imagine when 3D printers uh, get to the state where they can create all kinds of things with all kinds of different materials, that you could 3D print a desk or a, or a bicycle or an automobile. Um, and people could actually begin to manufacture their own custom boutique kind of manufacturing plants, right? You know, people could be creative, create their own cars, their own furniture, their own, you know, whatever. And, and these machines will enable people to be able to have an outlet for creating all kinds of beautiful things. I mean, the possibilities are, are wonderful to think about. You know, combining automation with a creative capacity of, of people, I think, is, is a wonderful possibility. But the one thing we have to realize is that when you combine automation with people, it changes things. Um, so we shape our tools, and then thereafter our tools shape us. Uh, that when we introduce a machine or a tool into a task, it changes things fundamentally. And in fact, it changes us. So maybe some of you have heard of this, uh, um, this report, but the London taxi cabs, uh, taxi cabbies who, who drive around the city, um, have this tremendous mental map of the city in their head. And they actually have determined that 
they can detect that their hippocampus is actually larger than, than average. That, 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 it's called the knowledge. Yeah, so they, 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 they've actually developed uh, and, and used their brains in certain ways that have developed their, 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 uh, um, their ability to be able to move about in, in space. And if you were to um, automate that task, if we begin to rely more and more on GPS, for instance, it, it can actually have an effect on our hippocampus, for instance. And, and so what we need to think about is, you know, how are these machines affecting us? And there's at least... I mean, there's a number of different issues that come up, and, and I think an excellent read about that is The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr, who also wrote the book uh, The Shallows, and, and a well-cited article from Atlantic Magazine called Is Google Making Us Stupid? Um, which you can Google if you want to read it. <laughs> hey, issues in automation. So there's a substitution myth, and, and the substitution myth is something that basically says that... Um, um, a new tool changes the job is, 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 is what we need to recognize. That to just substitute a tool for another tool does, uh, is a direct substitution uh, ignores the fact that it changes things. Uh, they've even found that writing, longhand writing, is very different than typing in terms of um, uh, our minds and how we process information. Um, so we, we need to recognize that. Automation complacency. So what happens when a machine takes over too much uh, that a person becomes disengaged and situational, situational awareness can kind of erode, right? This is the idea of an autopilot and suddenly something happens and a pilot has to somehow jump in and, and recognize what's, what's happening. Uh, automation bias is the idea that humans, when they work with machines, often always assume the computer's correct and, and, and can make mistakes because of that assumption. So uh, in, in, in The Glass Cage, Nicholas Carr talks about uh, some research uh, around human-centered approaches to automation. And basically, the, the, the one, um, without getting into too much detail, one, one of the recommendations is, is to work on what's called the yerkes dodson curve. So, so humans uh, tend to be overwhelmed if there's too much that they have to kind of manage, uh, so if the automation isn't helping out enough. And then humans become a little bit disengaged from the task and complacent if they're not stimulated enough. And so there's this kind of sweet spot where you're not overwhelmed, but you're not you're not too disengaged, that you're able to, to, to work effectively and, and understanding that when we're building tools. All right, the, the last category is inappropriate automation. So are there tasks for which we ought not to automate, even though perhaps we could? And, and I would say that, yeah, there, there are. And in fact, uh, Japan is, is ahead of the game on some of this stuff, but there are people doing work and research in the area of child-minding robots and elder care robots. And the question becomes, like, are these areas where we ought to be automating? Should we be automating childcare? Um, it's efficient, <laughs> um, but is it appropriate? Um, and I think, uh, you know, when it comes to child, uh, when it comes to elder care, uh, Sherry Turkle uh, wrote a book called Alone Together, where she actually talks about social robotics and, and some of the issues that arise. And she has this quote. She says that some American enthusiasts argue that robots will be more patient with the cranky and forgetful elderly than a human being ever could be. Not only better than nothing, the robots will simply be better. And so there are these arguments, right? And, and also automating war. So there is work that's currently being done to, to build lethal autonomous robots that you can unleash in the battlefield that can make kill decisions on their own. Is that appropriate, ethically speaking? It's called drones. And while drones, well, right now there's still humans in the loop, generally, with, with, with these sorts of tools, but should we unleash machines that have no human oversight, that have been coded to search and destroy under sorts of conditions and, uh, and unleash them into the battlefield? Um, is that something we ought, should life and death decisions like that be things we automate? Um, and, and those bring up thorny ethical issues, and, and I have some deep trouble with them. Um, even in the field of personal relationships, intimate personal relationships, there is work being done on automation. This book by David Levy uh, called Love and Sex with Robots, he suggests that by the year 2050, robot human marriages will be legal. And there is work that's currently being done uh, to build lifelike um, uh, companions for people. And what's sad about this, and Sherry Turkle writes about this in her book, Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other, Sherry Turkle makes the point that a relationship with one robot is a relationship of one person. You know, and when we look at child-minding robots and so on, how do you learn empathy when you're interacting with a machine? Um, 
it might be that social robots that are made to interact and keep us company will actually make us more lonely in the end, uh, have the opposite effect. Um, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. But these are areas where I would say, you know, automating uh, relationships like these are inappropriate, um, I think uh, we, can, we can say. So the question is, what, what, what ought we to do? Right? We're standing on the threshold of this this world of automation that, that our machines are, 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 are potentially capable of doing, how do we do that responsibly? And, and uh, some of the authors I've been reading have suggested that allowing these things to be steered by economic pressures alone are going to lead to, to problems. If, if, if companies, and engineers, and computer scientists are driven by efficiency alone, what kind of world are we going to build? And perhaps there's a rule for policy, uh, a role for policy uh, and, and some recommendations that we can make. And, uh, and so this is adapted from the second machine, machine age, the, the book I, I uh, cited earlier. And, uh, and I've, I've taken some of the recommendations that I thought are very, very helpful, and I've added, added uh, a few variations of my own. But one of the recommendations that I think is a very good one is to use taxes and other incentives to develop machines that augment human ability rather than substitute for it. So encourage through taxes or through some other stimulus a work that actually works in this human plus robot kind of uh, thing, rather than just completely automating. Uh, and then secondly, and I think this is important, uh, nurture or celebrate the special categories of work to be done by humans only. Now we, we should be treating people who provide elder care and uh, child care, nursing, we, we, should, we should reward and celebrate those professions, because they're really important. Uh, there are areas where we don't want to um, where we don't want to see automation, I don't think. And I tell my computer science students too, like when I'm in an old age home, don't send in a robot. Like, come visit me. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be stuck alone. Um, and uh, uh, start a made by humans labeling movement. You know, so you've got this sort of, um, you know, uh, fair trade labels and you know, gluten free. You know, like maybe, maybe kind of like better homes and or what is it? Uh, uh, Good housekeeping seal of approval. You know, we have a, a like some kind of seal that we can put on that says, you know, this was made by a human. And and, and when you go out and you make a or a humans were involved in the manufacture of this product, <laughs> and you can actually make purchasing decisions based on actually keeping people employed. Um, and 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 I think maybe just maybe, and I haven't thought a lot about this, but maybe we can come up with a label. Uh, that, that, that that you can have some kind of normatively developed product, a normative seal of approval, you know, some kind of uh, good housekeeping kind of normative seal of approval where you've, you know, and people are already thinking about this in electronics, you know, like lack conflict-free minerals, so buying tantalum and other other materials uh, in a stewardly way that doesn't feed wars in other parts of the, of the world, you know, uh, environmental stewardship. Stewardship of people, looking after social norms, justice, all these sorts of things, and maybe have some kind of label that kind of says, "Yeah, that this company actually has thought about some of these things." And one, one example of a comp of, of an effort that, that that addresses many of these things is the Fair Phone product. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but if you if you Google it, that there's a product called the Fair Phone that's looking at ways to build into uh, a phone the ability to uh, re uh, repurpose it to upgrade it rather than throw it away, to source materials in, in, in a just way uh, that are conflict-free, to pay workers properly, and so on. So, all right. Um, and I would add, we need to join the dialogue. So we need to, as Christians, become part of the conversation about this and not allow it to passively watch as these changes take place. So there are places already where uh, people are beginning these conversations. The Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford is talking about you know, all these developments in technology that produce existential threats to humanity and what ought we to do. Uh, I've talked already about this, this, uh, this presidential report about the future of artificial intelligence. There's people working on, on thinking about AI and, and how do we design it so that it benefits people and society. I think as Christians, we have a lot of uh, sympathy with these kinds of conversations, and I think Christian thought in the public square can contribute to these dialogues in helpful ways. Um, 
Right, and uh, the uh, IEEE even has a technical committee on roboethics, and so the, the, these organizations are beginning to have this conversation. And I think as Christians, we have a lot of uh, yeah, we have a lot of resources um, and 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 and, uh, and and things that we can contribute to that dialogue, and we ought to be uh, joining that dialogue. So, in summary. Um, I will conclude. I'm, I'm running out of time, and I want to leave a, a bit of time for questions. Maybe some of you have heard of the classic story of John Henry. This is a, this is a statue of John Henry. The classic story of John Henry competing with the steam-powered hammer is a sad tale suggesting the inevitable triumph of automation over humanity. A more recent animated movie, which we talked about earlier, WALL-E, depicts a world where robots and automation have taken over almost every human task. Humans are portrayed as obese and passive, living in a spaceship and shuttled about on reclining chairs, you know, consuming beverages and entertained by personal screens. At the climax of the movie, what we see is the ship's captain struggling. He can barely walk at this point. And he, he, he waddles over to the main control panel and at the climax of the movie regains control over the automated machinery that was running the, running the ship. And I think the future of automation is neither inevitable nor unstoppable. And I think what we want to do is recognize that uh, we don't want to get to that point. <laughs> we want to take action sooner. We want to take, uh, uh, want to take responsibility for how we unfold these tools and do so in a way that are directed towards making the kind of world that, that God would, would, would have us make in obedience to him and to unfold them in ways that help our neighbor and, and, and the planet and help us yeah. care for each other and build the kind of world that we want to live in and that we ought to be living in. And so I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you very much.